Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. Hey everybody, so today we are going to talk about how you price your software. Awesome, man. Let's do it. Hey everybody, so it's Jackie Stook from Copenhagen. And Joe Glines from Dallas, Texas. Yeah, so today we are going to talk about how do you price your software. And and that's a big topic, of course. Um, we love to talk about stuff like that. And I'd say we've we've tried to make a small list where we'll mention some points to you. And and one of the big ones is what are your competitors' prices? Right. What what do you say about that, Joe? Do is isn't that a big one? It's huge, right? Because if if you're offering something up and there's someone else who's half your price yet the quality is the same or something, I mean what are the likelihoods you're going to get sales, right? Uh, the other thing I was going to say was before we even jump too much into this, the probably, I mean, the whole marketing of your software is sadly probably more important than the actual program itself, right? And and I know most of us don't want to hear that, but just it's true, right? And it's so true. So make sure, you know, when you're creating a new tool, you really think about the marketing aspects of it because it changes everything. So getting back into the competition, right? Or it's, it, it's really, it's, I come at it from an economical, you know, view of what are the readily substitutable things, right? Like, cause if people are going to buy your tool or they're going to buy something else, like, you know, what is that, right? And how do you compare to those? Yeah, absolutely. I, I know that firsthand as well is I, I had a great tool for a specific task and I know it would have never become the thing it was if it wasn't for advertising and, and actually having an idea of how to reach people that would use it. So, so yeah, those things are really big. And I'd you know, say what, even, even, yeah. Well, I was gonna say, let's make sure we make a video on marketing, you know, a little bit bigger of the different aspects, the most important things to consider. So anyway. Yeah. And I'd say even with the first one I, I mentioned before, what are your competitors prices? I have used that multiple times before setting my own price. I have made sure to check out the competitors' prices, not because I need to match them precisely. I, I could go I, higher, I could go lower, depending on the actual market, uh, depending on if I believe that my tool brings more, or if I had hit uh, the uh, the need of the customer better, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, which actually leads, and I think you're spot on, Jackie, you led us into the very next one about how much value are you delivering, right? It's one of the most important things to really consider because it, it which, the, and I thought you were going to go there for, for you, but when, when I go buy anything, what's the first thing I do, right? I go look at it and then I go, well, how does this compare to other things, right? Like it's, it's how, what we all do, right? It's, I don't think it's a, it's not. It's actually, honestly, on average, it's a good thing to be priced at a premium, right? And deliver, a, a, you know, an expensive item uh, because price often gives, if people have no way to judge your tool, they use price as an evaluation of quality, right? So it's it's one of the big things that people will end up doing. So you don't necessarily want to be the cheapest out there, right? Because people start thinking it's not worth it. I'm going to, you know, hey, let's get the better one. Uh, but it is very, very important to take into account also, which is what you said at the very beginning is like, hey, if I'm, if I'm, and I forget how you phrase it, you said like delivering value. No, if I, it depends on how you, you know, what you're delivering to them. And if you're really hitting it, you know, and, and really serving them up with a lot of value, you can charge a premium, right? And it's, and it's even more importantly stated when you pitch yourself as a premium, people even believe it more, right? So it's, it's very important that marketing to position yourself when you do that. Yeah, I've, I've seen my, I've seen that I've apparently hit uh, the nail on the head a few times because uh, I've had competitors uh, copy my um, copy. <laughs> so, no. so whatever I've uh, made um, of different write-ups to sell my product, I've seen that show up uh, word by word on, on other people's um another competitor's site. So I'd say one of the big ones that we also have in, in value delivery is, are you saving them money? Are you saving them time, time, time? That's a big one. That's one of the ones I often try and sell with. Um, 
errors, removing errors, absolutely. Um, and I'd say I, I'd go on to the next one. Um, what will your prospects have to do when they don't have it? Right? What, what are you going to do without your tool? Right, because I mean that's what it boils down to, right? Is let's say sometimes you're creating something that just doesn't really have a readily substitutable, you know, offer out there. It's rare, but it happens, right? Uh, when you're doing that, how do, how do you come up with a price? Well, it gets back to what are the alternatives, right? Well, the alternative A is they don't they do it manually. They find another way to get, accomplish the same goal. How long does that take them, right? And some of those things you brought up of is it a lot more time? Is it more money because they're you know, taking more time or paying employees, or are there a lot more errors with it? Um, you know, what are other things that you can offer to them? And and that'll help you understand, you know, what it's worth. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say this one also covers the, the next under point to this one, right? How much, um, yeah, disposable income does, does your prospect have, right? Or how much are they willing to actually pay to to have this issue solved? And and I've also tried to use that in some cases where uh, I, I take a game as an example. I knew that people were using money in it and I could save them lots of time. What was their spending limit already to save time? And could I somehow match that or beat it? Uh, something like that where you have an idea of what the majority is willing to already put up on the table to have an easier time and if you can get close to that or beat that price then then you have something going for you absolutely yeah and and i just made a note jackie just from what you said because it's a really really important it's a subtle but important thing to take into account um, and it has to do with pricing in general, not very specific, but is your target audience already spending some money somewhere on something like this? Because if they don't ever spend any money like in this thing at all, it's real hard to get them to first open up that wallet and start spending a little bit of money. But if they're already spending some money, it's so much easier to, to get them to actually buy, right? So, the and of course, the higher that price is, if they're not spending money, it's just that much harder to get them to start spending. So it's another thing to take into account is if they're not spending any money on it at all, man, it, it's really hard to get someone to actually even think about it. So it, you almost have to reposition, you know, and it really clarify you're saving money, you're saving time. It's worth it because they, they have no concept of like, well, wait a minute, why, why would I buy something like this? I've, I've even seen it where where you would go in and you would know that um, let's say people are in a competitive market they're they're selling on the phone or whatever they're doing they know there are lots of people out there doing the same thing and they know that competition is already using a tool that costs some kind of thing it could be an IPA tool it could be all kinds of things but your prospects they believe that the competitors are using money to get an advantage if you can then offer them something that's maybe even better priced or even better than what they believe the competitors are using well, they'll be willing to put up that cash yeah, which is why it's so important to focus on the value right of what you're doing not not hit too hard on the price itself but how much are you going to save them or how many benefits you're going to get from it because even a higher cost item if you're pricing it more can save them more money right it's just you want them to focus on the value not on the actual cost of what you're selling yeah and i'd say if if the stuff starts uh, rolling in to your it, you will also have the next point we have here right yeah <laughs> clear on what will your tax responsibilities be? And and that can be from where I'm at, they will be totally different from where Joe is at. But yeah. get that sorted, right? Make sure you have that down. Yeah, and, and to your point, because Jackie, you and I, you know, not, not recording wise, we've talked a lot about this over the years of also, do you have to hire some sort of like an accountant? And what are those costs going to be? And do you have to start an LLC, some type of company or a holding company or whatever? I mean, there's all these other things. I know Jean Lalonde and QAP pays extra money to, what is it? To, um, 
certify, I forget, his executable yeah. type of thing. That's a couple hundred a year. There are other things like you don't envision, and then whammo, out of nowhere, there are these other costs that you know just add up in there. Yeah, I, I have had a, a licensing software uh, thing going on in, in Europe for quite a few years now. And, and because I'm offering digital software with a license, uh, I apparently have to pay sales tax in every country that I sell the software to. So if you're placed in France, I actually need to pay sales tax in France. Um, Fair enough, uh, Europe have made it uh, easier to do it locally. They have separate instances in the different countries where you can give them all of the information and then pay them and then they'll distribute it. But I still need to keep track of it just right. to make. Yeah, and it makes it interesting, not that I'm encouraging this, but perhaps you can find somebody that lives in a country where they don't have all these restrictions and have them kind of you know be the actual uh, a home for the company and maybe avoid some of this headache you know yeah, in, in the u.s what... in the u.s it's perfectly fine to strategically plan ahead and say i'm going to have my company based here and avoid all these taxes it's perfectly fine now you can't do that after the fact right that's where you get in trouble you, you know, I can't move it there after and say, no, no, it was never here. And you know, suddenly you're in a world of trouble. But if you plan ahead, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it, it's just a great idea to have some kind of overview. If, if you're not sure if you're going to be selling anything, but as soon as you see something trickle in, just research it just a tad to have an idea if you need to hire someone or if you think you can manage it yourself. Yeah, which gets into our next one of, hey, what are, you know, what are other just general upkeep costs, you know, ongoing costs? Like, do you have a website? Do you have a, the certification thing I mentioned that the QAP has? Do you have a, a account fees or accountant fees or advertising fees? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that can be in there, right, that you want to factor in when you're deciding on your pricing. Yeah, hosting fees, whatever it might be. It, right. it all uh, adds up. Adds, whatever, yeah. Yeah, and, and I do want to point out one thing here. And remember, I spent 20 years in corporate America working in market, well, not all of it market research, but a lot of it was around there. And a lot of companies simply look at what it costs them to produce something and add on 10% or 15%, whatever. They base it off of what it costs them. And it's a terrible, terrible approach for pricing, right? Um you really should be looking at your target market and understanding what it's worth to them and your competition. Those are the big ones. But um, it. But my point also is you should you you can't not look at what it costs you because obviously you got to take that into account and make sure whatever price you're doing is higher than what it's costing you. Yeah, I'm sure that's one one of the reasons that I'm seeing. Let's say restaurants and stuff like that. Um, small shops being up for a year or two and then going under again. And that's most likely because they get this one wrong. Right? Uh -huh. They don't really grasp how much costs are outside of just the ingredients into the stuff they're selling. They, they might be taking their price on the ingredients and their own salary or whatever, right. Right. and then off with that. But actually getting all of the rest of it um also is quite important yeah and and let me jump to sort of near the end of our list just so you understand where we are but um there's other things like in business once you realize hey if i build a list of customers are there other things i could sell them right can i bundle it with something else or can i sell them more things because it's the customer acquisition is by far the most expensive process right the best way to make more money in a, in a business isn't for finding necessarily new customers. It's selling more stuff to your current customers is usually much easier, right? So when you have one product, you know, and especially if it's something that's consumable or, you know, you know whatever, you can sell more and more and more. It's very easy on most of our stuff. It's, it's a one, they buy one and they're done, or maybe they'll buy a couple licenses. They're done. Uh, that's why we often like the recurring monthly fees, right? To help keep a steady flow. But the alternative would be is just what are other tools I can then create to sell them also, which would help you absorb some of those larger costs. 
Yeah, I, I saw this recently in, in one of these um, gurus or whatever you'd call them. Um, one of his big points was do not try and branch out in a way where you have one market, you've gotten something that works, you are selling that, and then you think, oh, Bitcoin are nice. I'll also do something with Bitcoins. And you know what? If if I then flip houses, that's great. If if that's not exactly what you, what your uh, if you have focused on one and used your energy on that one exactly, um, selling to those established customers something that's still within your range, yeah. expanding right. on your product or bundling more with it, the the chances of making more there are probably bigger. What a hundred percent because and that's where again we'll focus on the general stuff and other videos, but positioning becomes critical. And once you're you're established in one area, that's the area you own in the customer's mind. And and if you start mixing it up, you no longer now you have mudded the waters, right? You no longer have a crystal clear thing of this is what I stand for. I'm into these other things. So this is why again you'll you'll end up making more money if you stay in a general area and don't get too far out of it. Um the next one, which I know from talking to, especially to Jean and Lon, was uh, the um, ongoing costs not um, of how much upkeep is it, sorry, for like troubleshooting and bug fixes and things. So, hey, if you're charging, let's say it's uh, uh, 10 bucks a month, let's say, right? That's probably people are going to have high expectations that if something breaks, you need to fix it, you know, and fix it relatively soon, right? If you're charging four dollars total ever, you, you know, is it, does anyone have any real expectations that you're going to fix the the problem or at least you know address it right away? I mean, there's far different expectations. Yeah, I've I've had software like that where where let's say it was uh, people were on a license and that license covers a month and for some reason the interface is changed. Whatever the company on the other end does. The API is uh, refurbished, whatever it might be. So the thing they have licensed from you doesn't work from for uh, hours or maybe days, depending on however it hits you and how heavy the, the change is. I've had people where they're, let's say they're paying me $10 a month and they're like, shouldn't we be compensated for the eight hours we couldn't use it? And I'm not even sure I can break ten dollars, ten dollars down to the hour amount, and and re reimburse them that. Right. Uh, whereas it's it's like, come on, <laughs> you're, you're you're getting a so pretty true. good deal already. Do do right. really is is that important enough? But yeah, yep. uh, expectations on how our bugs going to be fixed is a great one to get down because. I've, I've well, been in a company here where they'll come, there's a service deal, they'll come and check out the physical things like the windows or whatever. There might be a motorized uh, blind or whatever. And if they see that doesn't work, they'll rebuild you or quote you what it will cost to fix it. So you're, we are actually paying them to come and find bugs and then they're billing us to fix them. And yeah. that's one of the things I think a lot of people in software might be forgetting until they get a full business up and running because, well, yeah, you've already paid me. I, I love happy customers. I'll try and fix the bug. But then you use five hours on fixing a bug or whatever it might be, but you're not getting any type of pay. Shouldn't right. you at least get your hour rate for it? I don't know. Something well, like which is a great point, Jackie, which we kind of were generally talking about, you know, pricing something and selling it to a general audience. But hey, sometimes you have a client that you're working for and you develop code for them and it, you know, it works that you got to be very clear with them. If something breaks, you know, who's paying the bill, right? Because generally speaking, you're not tacking on 20% more just in case something breaks so I can fix it without having to charge them right if if something breaks it's custom code they're responsible to pay you to fix it right within reason yeah exactly and it kind of goes into the next one right to offer a refund or warrant or something like that 
And and I'd say I've I've had software with refund, um, let's say seven day money back guarantees, and and I've said, read articles and uh, different things that says, depending on the thing you're selling, depending on the lifetime expectancy of the customers and stuff like that, you might even go with a refund uh, time of life. Absolutely, um, it, it's a huge either, draw. Yeah, yeah. Either people are gonna use it or they ate. Right. So. Right. Uh, yeah. depending that, of course on the thing that extra lift you get because you say you have such a strong guarantee i absolutely guarantee you you will love this or you get your money back whenever like the number of people that end up refunding two years later is so tiny but the lift the extra sales you get because of that strong warranty or guarantee right it's it's i i 100 agree with you um I want to tie this in a little bit uh, into some of your from from my you know talking to you about one of your projects. Um, also, with just should you charge anything? Should you have a free offer or you know have a free open for like two weeks trial and then do whatever? And this kind of gets to earlier. See if you agree with me with this. Offering that free thing without having any charges sounds good. But you bring in the riffraff, you bring in people that just complain and whine and consume so much time. And it often, it sounds great, but you bring in all these really bad people who are never going to really probably pay you. So yeah, I'm not I, a big I, believer it's a good thing. <laughs> no, I, I'd say I, I had it with, with at least a few different types of software and, and at least a few of them also had expectations of the customer they needed to do their part to make the stuff work as expected and because of that they had a bit of setup that needed right. to be within a specific frame and because of a, a offering it up for free for for days or weeks they were immediately expecting customer service right um, one to one uh, setup advice and they might not even end to go to the end of the free trial, meaning I would use however much time I was using on on helping people and them just dropping out because you know what it was free, right? They had nothing uh, to hold them there or nothing to make them serious about getting the help that I was offering. So yeah, I I do not. Mm, really see that as, as a great way of getting customers in. Yeah, which which I'm going to, I added a bullet on mine just to break it out separately, but understanding how knowledgeable your prospects are and how much either training or learning you're going to have to do or support, however you want to phrase it, to get them to adopt, like, because it, it could be night and day, right? You might have a lot of customers who, they don't need any training, right? And you can have a couple of videos and they're good, but there's going to be some percent and maybe you just make it very clear. Hey, the training, you know, if you're having troubles getting it to work, you know, you got to pay a small fee or a fee, you know, to help justify it because otherwise you're, when you bring in that riffraff, you bring in the people that are those headaches, boy, you know, I actually at lunch today, I was talking to a buddy of mine who also programs on auto hockey. And uh, we were saying how, you know, without when you're developing, and it's a great topic for another podcast, is uh, when when you're developing something and you don't tie costs to changes, you know, in your design. Like, let's say you're doing, you bid a project and it's, let's say, $5,000. And then you go to the meetings and they keep adding changes and new things. And, you know, you need to account for that, right? Uh, otherwise, they're always going to ask for more, right? So, it, it's, I think it's a really good topic to talk through. How do you lock that down and make sure that if you did bid it by a project, which I stopped doing, right? I no longer even do that just because it's it's so unwieldy. It's crazy. But making sure you set expectations correctly. Otherwise, they have these wild things. So just being, uh, it's like Southwest Airlines and they're very good at communicating when there's delays and things. And it, it's all about setting expectations, right? So I think as long as you're very clear about it, it's it's great. You don't have to offer all this crazy stuff. Just be very clear, you know, what your plans and policies are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I forget, was it me or you? On, 
I, I think do, I, maybe I'll just scooch up to one that I think we have kind of covered that is touched on. We yeah. have costs and, and we were kind of on that, but this one was more like if if you have a fixed cost or do you have a per sale cost? So every time you actually sell the product or, or the program or whatever it is, is there some kind of time you need to invest or um, does if if you, let's say you had an, an actual physical product uh, you would have a cost of actually getting it to the customer you could either ask them to cover it but then you would need to know uh, fully what it actually costs you it's probably not enough to just have post-its down right what right. what does it actually cost to get uh, UBS to deliver it? No, it probably also costs you something to go into sure. your warehouse and get it and package it and send it. Uh, so, so covering a per sale cost is is a great one as well. Do you have one time costs versus do you have ongoing costs? Stuff like that. Really, really important to get down. I was laughing. I'm going to sidetrack this just a hair, but I was laughing because I was thinking about when I did you that quote unquote favor and mailed you a package I didn't tell you about, right? Um, and of course, you're in Denmark. So and I spent, I forget, like $60 or whatever to send it. You know, the first bid was like 300 and whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not paying that. Second one was like 60 bucks. I'm like, oh, cool. It was a couple t shirts, you know, and a water bottle. And, and, and what was so funny was, what'd you tell me? You're like, yeah. Yeah, Joe. Thanks. What was what was it like? Sixty or seventy dollars? You got a note from your post office yeah. saying you have to come down here and pay. I forget how much Krona, but it was like sixty or seventy bucks or something, right? It was as much as I paid, yeah. just because I had set the value at like a hundred dollars or something. So I ended up costing you, you know, this money, and I'm like. Oh, that was sorry. That was just so funny. Like, yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. See that. international import, uh, and and I I had to to pay a, a good amount. I, I of course was notified that it came from from uh, you. Uh, yeah. So like, yeah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> I, I want to receive that, but yeah, it, it was kind of sad that we we had to yeah pay both ends. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so one of the next ones, though, is getting back into the whole cost of stuff. If you're going to be doing marketing or advertising in some ways, right? There's if if any if people are interested, chime in the comments here. If you're interested in learning tips and tricks on how to, you know, uh, reach your customers, because I honestly twice a week I have a pop up on my calendar that says, "How can I find ways to reach you know customers basically without spending a lot of money, right? To borrow other people's lists, and this and that." Um, so there's some great ways to do it, although there's also things like Facebook advertising, right? There's some great ways, but how easy is it to identify your target market? Can you build a persona or a profile of them? How much is it going to cost you to run ads or to rent lists or to get in a newsletter, right? There's a lot of ways you can do stuff, but it's advertising and marketing costs that you need to think about because, again, back to this whole thing, People have this perception that I'm going to build the the perfect thing, and then it's going to sell like crazy, right? And it just it just never happens, right? It's no, it's no, the marketing, no. yeah, the mentality of build it and there will come. It, it I, I've not seen it work uh, really that way. I'm, I'm not saying it isn't possible, but if you if you build that golden goose, but no one knows about it. Right. Why? Right. The word of mouth or going viral or whatever, it's it's, it's not super not rare. Reliable. Yeah, it's super super rare. And most of the time that we're aware of it, it was you know five years or more of hard work on you know someone who kept doing things over and over and spending money and time, and it finally got in front of enough people that suddenly it does go viral, and that can happen, but it's you know. It, obviously, it's not easy, right? Which gets actually to the next point was the whole, how do you reach? There's the, how do you identify them? But then how are you going to reach them, right? And those are two very different things, but those have a huge impact on your cost. Yeah, and if you can get those down, I can tell you, you can make some money. That's for sure. If you have a good way of identifying them and then reaching them, if those two you can build almost a scaffolding and they'll still buy it, right? It, 
just because you can get in front of the right people, some will be interested, and that will make you able to make at least some money. Awesome. Are we are we done? I think we covered yeah. Yeah, a lot of different that. things to consider. I do have, if anyone's interested, I'll try to remember to link to it. There, there are like four questions you can ask, you know, so ask, you know, 10 prospects, these four questions, and it can help you set like the minimum and maximum amounts you should be charging. And the, and the, the truth is it should be somewhere, you know, in between there. Right. But it's a simple max. I can't remember the, the exact name of it, but it's, been, it's a market research thing I learned years ago. It's a qualitative thing. It's not quantitative, which means it's kind of simple, but it gives you some ideas, right, of, of how to price it. Yeah. Anyway, if you guys have other things you think we should have thrown in here, please chime in. It'd be really helpful to, to hear. Um, and if you have interest in those other topics, let us know. We'll prioritize them. Absolutely. Very happy. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye.